working through the book of 1 Thessalonians as a congregation. Uh, This little letter written by the Apostle Paul, what we've said each week, a real letter written by a real person and written to real people. And sometimes when we read the letters of Paul, we forget he was a real human being and the people to whom he wrote were, were a real congregation. And the church in Thessalonica was experiencing persecution. They were suffering for their faith. And uh, in the midst of that suffering, they were growing and maturing and uh, moving forward in their Christian relationship to Christ and, and to the church. And in many ways, we can relate to them, not in the sense of persecution, uh, but in the sense that things aren't what we wish they would be at this particular time in, in history. And yet, as difficult as the days may be for us, Uh, We need to to pick our chins up off the ground, and we need to quit moping around. We are the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, and scattered around this world are brothers and sisters who are genuinely suffering for their faith. We have inconveniences and, and things that sometimes we just don't like about the circumstances and situations in which we're living Uh, But around this world are people who know what it's like to put their lives on the line to love and follow Jesus Christ. The church needs to be the church. We need to be the light of the world. We need to be a people that quit complaining about Zoom meetings. There are people in this world that would do almost anything if they could meet with brothers and sisters on Zoom. We need to quit focusing on what we can't do, and we need to give glory to God for all of the things we can do. We may not be able to gather together as we typically do in our Bible fellowship groups. We can do it on Zoom, but small groups can gather together. Two or three brothers or sisters gather together for coffee, uh, however they feel most comfortable being able to do that. There are things we can do, and we ought to take advantage of of those things. So we turn our attention to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 this morning to a section where Paul begins to strongly exhort the Thessalonian Christians about Christian living. And in chapter 4, verses 1 through 8, I want to talk with you this morning about the will of God. This is the will of God. Now, there are so many things about the will of God that we struggle with discerning because God's Word doesn't specifically address to us, should I buy this home or, or that home? But God's Word does give us principles to guide us. We should buy a home, if we're going to buy one, that we can afford, where we're not going to be house poor, that's not going to put undue pressure and stress on our families. We know principles that can guide us. We have wise brothers and sisters who have walked with Jesus much longer than we have that are very wise financially. We can go to them, and we can talk to them, and we can, we can pray about God's plan and God's will and discern, okay, should I go in this direction or that direction, maybe with the purchase of a home? But much of God's will is clear, it's definitive, it is, it is right before our eyes in His Word, and, and we see that this morning in this passage. I want you to notice with me in the, in the opening verses, God's pleasure is our guiding principle. That is, as we're making decisions in life and as, as we are thinking about choices that we're to make, well, uh, particularly ethical choices, God's pleasure needs to be our guiding principle for living. Look with me beginning in verse 1. Finally then, brethren, we request and exhort you in the Lord Jesus that as you receive from us instruction as to how you ought to walk and please God, just as you actually do walk, that you excel still more. Now, you'll notice he says, finally, it sounds like a good Baptist preacher, but actually he means in addition to. Uh, He's not ready to wrap up the letter. In fact, he's only about halfway through the letter. And he reminds them that they are in a covenantal relationship. They are in a family relationship. Though he uses the word brethren, we understand that he's speaking to brothers and sisters in Christ. He's writing to the church made up of males and females, brothers and sisters who have put their faith in Christ. And he is exhorting them and encouraging them about how they are to walk. 
the idea of life as a walk, it's a Semitic idea, it's a Hebraic idea, it's a, an idea maybe we're not familiar with, but basically it means we live our lives moving forward. Uh, he describes life as a walk because we should be headed somewhere. We shouldn't just be walking around in circles. We shouldn't just be standing still. We ought to be moving forward, particularly in our spiritual lives. So as we are living our lives and we are seeking to make decisions on a daily basis, our decisions should be guided by that which pleases God. And so when we get ready to have a discussion with our spouse over a very tense issue or tenuous matter, we need to make sure my speech, my tone, my content is pleasing to God. So if I'm not speaking to my wife in the right tone, if I'm not speaking to my wife in the right way, it's not pleasing to God, then I need to change the way that I speak to my wife. My, my words, my thoughts, my demeanor, my disposition, it needs to be pleasing to God as you walk and live life. And then he goes on and he says, parenthetically, just as you actually do walk or just as you actually do live. But the Christian life is to be one that we are ever growing in, maturing, developing. We're either, we are either headed forward or moving backwards. Uh, there, there's no stagnation in the Christian life. When we quit growing, we start diminishing in our spiritual lives. It doesn't matter if we've been a Christian five years or 50 years, five minutes or 25 years. We need to be moving and growing and maturing and reading and studying. There's no place for the lazy Christian mind. There's no place where we shouldn't be seeking to become more and more Christ-like in, in every area of life, so that you excel still more. So we, we, we have Christ as our goal, pleasing Him as our motivation, uh, but we need to be growing and maturing and developing in that. And then he goes on and says in verse 2, For you know what commandments we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. And so Paul refers to the fact that his word, God's word, he wrote God's word. He wrote as a human being under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He wrote to first century Christians and he also, unbeknownst to him, was writing to 21st century Christians. And so God has promises and he has commands in his word that guide us in how to live. And these commandments are intended to help us discern God's will and to live God's will. Well, the second thought that I want you to notice, and this is the very heart of the passage today, God's will is our moral purity. God's will is our moral purity. We are no longer in the midst of a sexual revolution. We are on the other side of a sexual revolution, and we are, in the, we are ever uh, falling into a deeper and deeper precipice in, in moral ambiguity and, and in moral obscurity. Uh, that is, in just a matter of a few years, marriage, the idea of marriage throughout the history of the world until just a few years ago, was one man and one woman. It was monogamy, a man and a woman. Well, well, that's been completely overturned. And now we have women marrying women and men marrying men. But mark my word, it won't stop there because it can't stop there. Once you begin the moral free fall away from God's plan for the family, it will only disintegrate more and more. If women can now marry women and men can now marry men, then why can one man not be married to many women if that's the choice that they make? And why is it that one woman can't be married to many men? Polygamy will be the next fall on the moral dominoes of marriage. And in fact, it's already in the court system. LGBTQ, who would have ever thought 
at the turn of this century that a relatively small movement would now be in absolute control of the entertainment industry and be one of the most po powerful political forces in the nation today. Uh, a percentage of people that is very, very, very small now control a great deal of the political discourse and a great deal of the legislative direction of our, of our nation. Paul wants to teach us here in these verses what God's will is for moral purity. Who would have dreamed that with the inception of the internet, that in our day and time, the majority of nine-year-old boys would have already have viewed pornography on many occasions? Who would have dreamed of the devastation and destruction that the internet, through at pornography through the internet, has brought the damage to, to families, Christian and non-Christian families? We live in a moral war, and God has given us guiding principles that can help us navigate a world filled with moral minefields. So he says in verse 3, for this is the will of God. We never have to pray about this. We never have to doubt this. This is God's will, your sanctification. Now, sanctification is a, is a very big word. We've talked about it many times. We can think of salvation in three parts. There's justification. Justification takes place the moment we are saved. We are forgiven of all of our sins, and we are counted righteous in Christ Jesus. At the end of our life, the moment we die or the moment Christ returns, we are conformed into his character perfectly. We will see him and we will be like him. So on one end is justification, on the other end is glorification, and the in-between is this very arduous period known as sanctification. Sanctification is the process by which we become more and more conformed into the image of Jesus. We still have indwelling sin. We still have battles to be fought. We still have issues to be dealt with. Every single one of us. It doesn't matter if we've been a Christian, as I mentioned a moment ago, just a few days, or we've been a Christian for many, many decades. We are to keep growing in Christ because of indwelling sin. There are areas in our character that need to be refined into Christ's likeness. And and we should stop along the way from time to time and ask ourselves, okay, what area is Jesus at work at in my life right now? What is he doing in me right now? Because he, he gives us the power to do battle with indwelling sin. So there's a cooperative effort. God enables us, but he will not put to death the sin that he commands us to put to death. So he says, for this is the will of God, your sanctification. That is, now he's going to deal with a specific focal issue. That is that you abstain from sexual immorality. Uh, that we live morally pure lives in our minds and in our behavior. That you abstain from. So it's, it's never a question, should I pray to God that I should treat this person I'm not married to like I am married to them in a physical way. No, you never have to pray about that because God has confined certain privileges and blessings to marriage. So he goes on to say in verse 4 that each of you know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor. So what he's saying is we need to know our weaknesses and we need to put up boundaries. We need to put up fences. We need to put up guards. We need to recognize there are certain places we can never go mentally or emotionally. So we need to put up 
barriers for God's glory for our good, and if we're married, for the protection of our marriage, and if we have children, for the protection of our children. Because if we fall to sexual promiscuity, not only if, as a believer do we defame the name of Jesus, we severely damage, almost irreparably damage our relationship with our spouse, and we do catastrophic damage to our children, whether they, are, whether they know what we've done or not. Because we cannot be the kind of parent we need to be without being morally pure. So he goes on to say in verse 5, not in lustful passion like the Gentiles who do not know God. That is, when he refers to the Gentiles, he's referring to non-Christians. There are three races of people. There are non-Christians, there are Jews, and there are Christians in Paul's teaching. There are non-Christians, those outside of Christ. There are Jews who are outside of Christ, and then there are Christians. So when he refers to Gentiles, he's referring to non-Christians. So he says, not in lustful passion like the non-Christians who do not know God because they have no relationship with God. They have no uh, inclination to live for God. And that no man transgress and defraud his brother in the matter. That is that we don't defraud someone. We don't, we don't sin against someone in the matter of, of moral purity because the Lord is the avenger in all these things just as we also told you before and solemnly warned you. Now, he's writing to a people, many of whom have been saved out of paganism. They worship the gods of the Greek pantheon, as we've talked about. And a great deal of ancient idolatrous worship involved temple prostitution. And the immorality of the ancient world is very commensurate with the immorality of our world. There's not a great deal of difference between their immorality and, and our immorality. And so he's warning them that God will not sit passively by, but God will punish and discipline those who fall into sexual sins. Now, he'll do it with all sin, but he's focusing right now here on, more, on the issue of moral, moral purity. And he says, I've told you this. And in fact, he says at the end of verse 6, I've warned you about this. The Lord is the avenger. Now, we shouldn't take all of the bad things in life that happen to us as an indication that God is punishing us. We live in a fallen world. In a fallen world, bad things happen to good people. But God is so committed to us that if we are living contrary to his will in a particular area of our lives, he will discipline us because he loves us. And sometimes we should just stop and think, all right, are, are the circumstances I'm facing unique to me? And are the circumstances I'm experiencing possibly God's chastisement because of the choices that I'm making? Because of the movies I'm watching, the websites I'm going to, the thoughts that I'm allowing to roll around in my mind that are uncontrolled. God will punish his people for their sin because he loves them, just like any good parent disciplines their child. So he goes on and he says in verse 7, for God has not called us for the purpose of impurity, but in sanctification. And so God's will is our moral purity. Uh, but I want you to notice thirdly in verse 8, God's gift is the Holy Spirit, because we may wonder, how can I do this? We live in a morally corrupt world. We live in a world where the television commercials nowadays would have been considered very, very inappropriate just 10 or 12 years before this. We live in a world where moral degradation is exalted as a virtue rather than a vice. How can I live in a fallen world and remain morally pure? Let me say you can't do it without a fight 
and you can't do it without God's Spirit. But notice what he says in verse 8. So he who rejects this is not rejecting man, but God, a good God who gives His Holy Spirit to you. So God gives us His Spirit to empower us to make godly choices in the area of moral purity. He he gives us His Spirit to convict us when we make a step in the wrong direction. He gives us His Spirit to discipline us so that He can bring us back to the place of moral purity. Well, well, let me sum it up with just a a few few final thoughts this morning as we think about these ideas related to God's gift is the Holy Spirit, God's will is our moral purity, and God's pleasure is to be our standard. The first is this, if you have fallen or are in the midst of moral impurity, and I choose my words carefully because we do have, we have children with us, if you have fallen into moral impurity, you're living in sin. God will not bless your life. God will not honor your parenting or your marriage. God will not guide you to the mate of your choice, one that would, be, that, that would help you and please you and be, a, and be a help to you spiritually if you're living a morally impure life. But God will forgive you, and God can rebuild your life. He can rebuild your marriage if you're married. But you need to come to Christ in confession. And then if you're a man, you need to find an older brother in Christ. If you're a woman, you need to find an older sister in Christ that can speak truth into your life. God will forgive you if you are His child. Don't hide it. Satan wants you to hide it. Don't hide it. Second, Guard your eyes, because your eyes are the pathway to your mind, and the mind is the highway to your heart. Guard your eyes. Make a covenant with Christ that you will guard your eyes. The eyes are a pathway to the mind. Paul taught us to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. What we see, what we gaze at, makes its way into our mind. And then what we allow to roll around in our mind becomes a highway to our heart. And Solomon said, guard the heart, for from it flow the issues of life. He should have taken his own advice. He was the wisest man on the earth, and he fell to He fell to moral impurity, and because he fell to moral impurity, his days ended in degradation and filth, and his life became an abysmal blight on the kingdom of God. And so, secondly, guard your eyes, because your eyes are the pathway to your mind. Your mind is a highway to your heart. Take every thought captive. Don't allow these thoughts to find a home in your mind because the thought is always the father of the act. We, typically, we do what we th- think about, except sometimes speaking to our spouse. We, we do what we think about. The thought is the father of the act. If you want to think about something, think about what will this thought do to my relationship to God? What will this thought do to my relationship with my spouse? How will this thought impact my parenting of my children? Third, recognize that pornography will destroy your life. Whatever momentary pleasure it may bring to you, Pornography will destroy your life. It will will make you less than the person God wants you to be. It will cause you to be less than the person you want to be. 
And all of the studies indicate that it is as addictive as cocaine. Now think about this. Probably none of us in here would think about snorting cocaine. But when you consider that internet pornography is every bit as damaging and equally, equally uh, contagious, it, it will lead us into a dark place. And only the most serious of help can get you out of that place. Now, the great news to the glory of God, God is greater. God is stronger. And He will help you by His Spirit as you begin to fight against it. If you're a man, find an older brother to hold you accountable. If you're a sister, find an older sister to hold you accountable. If you have to get rid of your television and your internet, get rid of it. Your family is at stake. Fourth, the fight is worth it. God's glory is worth it. God God helps us as we progress in sanctification. Progressive sanctification and the wholeness of your family are worth the battle of moral purity. I'm going to to ask you to stand, and I want to pray for us. You know, Paul's words are so helpful. He knows, God's Spirit knows what we need and when we need it. And these were the words that Paul wrote to first century believers, and they are the very words for 21st century believers believers. Let's pray together. Father, we pray in Jesus' name that 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verses 1 through 8 would be take, your spirit would take those words, plant them in our hearts to bear fruit to moral purity. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.